Hello everyone and thank you for joining us at the Institute of Physics Tyndall Lecture. I'm just going to check that we're recording. Yes, we are. Um, our lecture this year is titled Tuning Into the Radio Universe um, from Ireland and our 2021 speaker is Professor Peter Gallagher. He is the Head of Astrophysics in the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies and he's here to talk to us by, about his, one of his lead projects, uh, the ILOFAR project. I just want to remind everyone that you can ask questions in the chat box throughout the lecture. Our staff are moderating it and we will relay the questions to Peter at the end of the lecture. In the meantime, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Gallagher and uh, I hope you all enjoy the talk. Thanks very much. Great. Well, thank you very much, Lucy, and welcome everybody to this annual uh, talk, the Tyndall Lecture. I actually, I remember going along to it myself when I was um, uh, uh, back in college and uh, back in school as well. I remember attending them. So I hope you enjoy today's lecture as much as, as I did and I hope it inspires you to go on into science and on, on into physics. But what I'm going to talk about today is a project that really has been an inspiration for me over the past decade and that is building a radio telescope here in Ireland that is observing the night sky uh, actually observing the sun during the day as well and giving us profound new understanding or insights into the way stars work, the way black holes work and my favourite object in the universe is the sun and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But I guess the story starts um, back in you know ancient times maybe. Um, I think humans have always looked up at the night sky and you can't but be in awe of what you see above you. And uh, this photograph here shows, you know, the night sky as it looks outside uh, and away from city lights. So for those of you who are lucky enough to live away from city lights, you'll get this beautiful view of the night sky. And across the center of the night sky, you can see the Milky Way where there's gas and dust um, uh, and so on. But you know, humans have always asked questions like, you know, where did the stars come from? Where did they start? And um, are they always going to shine? Where are they going? And, you know, other questions that we, we, we are really interested in as well are things like, you know, maybe there are planets around some of these stars and is there life on one of those planets? And I think when I was at your stage, the answer would have been, you know, the odds are that, it, that there is, but we only knew of nine planets um, uh, back when I was your age. But now we have over 4,000 planets that have been detected outside our solar system. So there are many, many more planets known and many of them are rocky as well. So we're beginning to find rocky planets that are around quiet, nice stars. And these planets are not too hot and not too cold. They're Goldilocks planets. So the odds of finding life in the universe outside of our own is increasing day by day and what I'm going to talk to you about today actually is part of that story but it really does start back 400 years ago with Galileo and what Galileo did was something innovative and that's what this talk actually will will you know highlight as we go along there's there's a interplay between scientific discovery and technological innovation and in the case of Galileo the technological innovation was the telescope now, this is the telescope that he used. Um, it's quite a simple telescope. It has a lens at one end and then at the other end, an eyepiece. So there's a lens up here. It brings light down uh, to, to the eyepiece down here. But what Galileo did was he pointed it at the sun. Um, now, he didn't put his eye to the telescope. He, he projected it. But day by day, he followed the sun and he followed, he noticed that there were sunspots, these dark areas on the sun and they rotated across the disk. And this was a real innovation for him, for our, or a real innovation because it meant that, you know, it wasn't just some kind of simple object at the center of our solar system. It was moving, it was rotating, and it was constantly changing. He also um, looked at uh, Jupiter and also at Saturn. And look, these little sketches over here in his notebooks show uh, Jupiter. Um, but these little uh, asterisks here are the moons of Jupiter, uh, Io, Ganymede, Callisto and Europa. And day by day, he was able to show that these were moving. And the point is, though, 
his conclusion was that the universe is much bigger and it's not all about us. Everything isn't rotating around us. And the consensus at the time really was that everything was rotated about, uh, rotating about us. So the technological innovation with this telescope allowed him to see things in a very different way and gave us a new insight into the structure of bodies in our solar system. The sun itself is rotating and also there's this other planet out there that is also rotating with moons around it. So maybe we're not that special in this universe. If you jump forward a few hundred years to the late 1700s, um, this scientist called Herschel in, in a place called Slough in England built this enormous telescope. And really a theme of this talk will all be, will, will really will be about Bigger telescopes give you better views of the of the universe, and what they do is they collect more light. That's what this does. So if you collect more light, you can see faint objects. And what this telescope does, it's it's called a Newtonian telescope. It's a reflecting telescope. Light comes in through this entrance aperture here, comes the whole way down to the far end of the telescope, uh, where it's then reflected from a parabolic mirror, and then comes back up here to uh, another mirror, which is flat and it, it is then uh, fed into uh, an eyepiece. But what Herschel did with this is he was able to look at these objects called nebulae. So when you look at a star or if you, when you look at an object, some of them aren't actually point-like, some of them are kind of cloud-like. And at the time, nobody understood what they were. People were wondering, were they close to us or were they far away from us? Um, or what were they composed of? But with this telescope, he was able to resolve a lot of detail in these objects. And here are some of his sketches. You can see here, this is a um, this is actually part of a comet. Um, well, sorry, here's this is here, this is a, a comet here. This is the nucleus of a comet with a tail behind it. And then over here are all these so-called nebulae. They're wispy looking gas clouds, but he wasn't able to resolve any details in them. He wasn't able to see any stars inside them, so still didn't know. Uh, what they were composed of. And a thing called spectroscopy, which I'm sure you've, you've heard of in some of your classes, um, wasn't um, invented at the time for uh, astronomical observations or wasn't applied to astronomical observations at the time. So the only thing that could be done is to build bigger telescopes. And that's what an Irishman did in County Offaly, in Burr, County Offaly, and he built the largest telescope in the world, and actually it turned out to be the largest telescope in the world from the 1840s right up until um, about 1917. So for what is that, over 70 years, 75 years, um, the biggest telescope in the world was in County Offaly. And it's incredible that you know anywhere I travel around the world, if, if it's NASA, the European Space Agency, Australia, China, everybody will have heard of the great Leviathan Telescope of Burr County Offaly. And it was this gentleman here, uh, the Earl of Ross, who built it. He's, he was the third Earl of Ross. And actually, his wife and himself worked on building it. And she was also equally passionate about the project and was uh, took a lot of the photographs uh, of the telescope and was involved in its design. But between them, they built this. This is, um, uh, it's actually got a 1.8 meter diameter uh, entrance so uh, it can collect a lot of light and then this here you can see how large it is it's about three stories high you can see that there's a, an observer here in the observer box and with this telescope though he made profound new discoveries about um, these nebulae um, and this is one of his drawings um, of, uh, of, of a galaxy well we now know it's a galaxy but at the time uh, Herschel just saw a blob but Ross was able to see that it actually had this structure and he called it a whirlpool because it looked like a whirlpool in, in the river uh, that flows through, through Burr called the Campor River. Um, and well, well that's, that's, that's partly my theory. But um, what you can see is there's this wispy nature to it. And also there's a companion to it here as well. So there seems to be two objects that have the, this whirling gas uh, within it. And he also put a little prism up to the telescope and then was able to look at the spectrum of light uh, coming from these different objects as well. But this meant that the, it looked dynamic. 
the universe looked dynamic. It looked like it was moving. He wasn't able to tell that it was moving, but it looked like it was moving. And also he could see that there were small stars in this. And we now call this the Whirlpool Galaxy. He named it the Whirlpool. He also named the Crab Nebula as well. And just for comparison, here's a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, just to show you how much detail that he actually resolved. You can see that at the center of this, there are these beautiful uh, lanes of dust that those dark things are dust the red areas as well there's gas in those in the very center there's a black hole uh, a supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy and actually we'll come back to that later on but Ross's discovery and naming of this was was what made what gave us this concept of a galaxy a collection of stars that these nebulae are actually collections of stars um it wasn't until uh uh, another scientist called Hale built uh, a, a, another telescope. This was 100 inches in diameter. So the, the previous one was uh, 1.8 uh, uh, meters. Um, and this one is 100 inches, so just a little bit bigger. But that jump in size, and here it is here, the, this is the entrance aperture up here. The light comes right down here to the mirror at the very bottom. And actually, the observer sits in this box up at the very top, which must be pretty scary. But with this telescope, it allowed astronomers to make more precise measurements, to collect more faint light, and to see finer detail. Because the bigger the telescope is, the more light you can collect, and also the finer the detail that you can see on the sky. And that's called resolution. And with this, Edwin Hubble went and looked at lots of galaxies. And here are some of the galaxies that he was looking at. And it's amazing, if you just look at a small patch of the sky, you can see that there's millions and millions of galaxies. These are all small galaxies that are observed, um, actually this time with the Hubble Space Telescope. But what he noticed was that if he measured the distance and the speed of these, so you can measure the distance from the redshift, so that is, you know, you'd be familiar with the, an ambulance coming towards you and moving away from you and the pitch or the frequency that you hear from that ambulance changes and it goes from lower frequency to higher frequency as it moves away. The same with light that comes from these galaxies, its frequency changes and you can tell the speed of the object from that change of frequency called the Doppler shift. And he was also able to make the dis measure the distances use a using a thing called a standard candle. There's a certain type of star that has a fixed pulsation rate and a fixed brightness. And with that, you can measure the distance. Anyway, he plotted distance versus speed for all of these galaxies and found this. It was pretty much a straight line, which was pretty incredible. That, um, and it meant that things that are far away, so th these are things that are far away, are actually going very fast. And things that are close to us are going much more slowly. And the conclusion of this is that the universe is expanding. And he was able to fit a straight line to this. And he was able to show that the velocity and the distance are related to one another. Um, and there's a constant that relates them. So you in school would have y equals mx plus c. So h0 there is m is the slope of the line and basically that tells you the age of the universe so his paper concluded the not only that the universe was expanding but also he's able to work at the age of the universe but only with a bigger telescope and that was the key thing to get that bigger telescope now there's one equation in this talk and um, here it is here and it's a, a profound equation very important equation for telescope designers and what it says is you see this here this is the the diameter of your telescope and this is the wavelength you're observing at. But what it says is the bigger your telescope is, the smaller the things that you can see. Delta theta equals 1.22 lambda over D. So if you have a big telescope, you can see small things. And so what we're, astronomers are always trying to do is get that as big as possible so that you can see as small things as possible. And over here, it just shows you, say if you've got two stars in the sky and you've got a small telescope, you're just not going to be able to see the difference between the two teles the two stars. But if you have a big telescope, you'll be able to resolve them uh, because of this relation. It's called the Rayleigh criterion. Okay, so radio astronomers have been building bigger and bigger telescopes. This is in Jodrell Bank, just outside Manchester. If you're ever flying into Manchester, if we ever fly again, you'll see this uh, beautiful telescope. Uh, it's called the Lovell Telescope. 
Um, and just to give you an idea of scale, there is a door down there. So that's a door. So this is um, an enormous object, but they can only get so big because gravity calls them, calls, causes them to fall down. So that led to another innovation um, called a phased array. And here's a picture of a phased array with them. Um, one of the pioneers in the use of phased array, array this is a, a Jocelyn Bell Burnell. She was born in Lurgan in County Armagh um, and went to Cambridge uh, and she was uh, instrumental in building this telescope. And it doesn't look like a telescope. It's, it's a load of timber beams holding up a load of wires. But she told me actually the first thing she did, learned to do when she went to Cambridge was swing a, a pickaxe and a, and a very large um, a sledgehammer uh, building this telescope. But with this telescope, she made a profound discovery. She saw that there was these, when she pointed at a particular kind of star, that she got this ping, this regular ping, 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 ping. And that won the Nobel Prize. It was called a pulsar. It was actually a ra rapidly rotating star uh, about the size of Dublin, you know, 10 kilometers across. And um, it was rotating like a lighthouse. And every time the beam of radio waves from the star came towards us, her telescope picked it up. And she was able to make that discovery. And actually, very controversially, her, her supervisor, PhD supervisor, went on to win the Nobel Prize with a collaborator. Jocelyn did not, um, which was quite unfortunate. She's now Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell and has been very well rec re recognized nowadays. OK. So where are we nowadays then? Well, the Dutch uh, decided to build a, an even larger telescope about 10 years ago called LOFAR, and that is the Low Frequency Array. And it is built within the Netherlands, and they, got a they spent 100 million euros building the telescope uh, within the Netherlands. And that gave them a big enough telescope, but then other countries decided to join in. So the Swedes here in Onsala, then um, you've got the Germans, the Poles, um, also, the French got involved, the British got involved as well, and they created this large telescope. So these are radio telescopes that are all hooked up by fiber optic cables. And data taken, say, in Ansala and here in southern England um, are all piped back into a supercomputer in the Netherlands where they put together the pictures. But now you have a telescope that's a thousand kilometers across. And with that, if you remember that formula, delta theta equals 1.22 lambda over d. If d is big, you can see small things, and that was the point of this telescope. Now it looks weird. It's a very strange looking telescope. Here's um, the center of it, very Dutch looking. You can see um, lots of water around, and it's very flat, um, the canals. But this is the telescope, and these are the high frequency antennas and the low frequency antennas. And they're cheap, um, but and, and the point of being cheap is you can then deploy them and lots of them all across Europe. Um, um, and the, the low band antennas see be below FM radio, they see about 10 to 90, 90 megahertz. And then the high band antennas see above FM radio, they see about 110 megahertz, right up to 240 megahertz. And it's just incredible how much data that these are collecting. Um, you're talking about uh, terabits per second of, of data. So um, there's dedicated fiber that's going out of all of these uh, back to a supercomputing center. Now, the elements of the telescope are quite simple. Here's a picture of the low band antennas. And this is basically just a wagon pipe. Um, at the top of it is a preamplifier, and that takes very weak signals that are collected here um, by these cables. So these are just cables. Um, and the cables collect radio waves that again then gets amplified and then gets put onto a cable, a coaxial cable, and sent off to a computer. And you have 10,000 of these across Europe. So any faint signals, you can add up all the faint signals and get a stronger signal. So they're the low band, they work at 10 to 90 megahertz. The high band antennas, these work at uh, 110 to 240 megahertz. And they look a bit weird. Um, uh, you can see there's this tarpaulin, there's a black tarpaulin that's over it, and that protects what's inside. This actually is just polystyrene. And then inside there are antennas actually, and we keep them in position with the polystyrene and then safe from the elements uh, with the black tarpaulin over them. But there are many, many uh, 
kind of coat hanger looking antennas inside here. So each one of these boxes has um, four, four, 16, so one, two, three, four, four by four uh, antennas in here times two. So you can see we have a lot of antennas in here and then there's 96 of them in every single station. So the Dutch and other European collaborators were working on this project and a group of us then in Ireland from, from the Republic and from Northern Ireland came together uh, to build a LOFAR station here in Ireland. And we, the consortium includes uh, universities from you know, Cork, and uh, Galway, Dublin. Uh, we have Arma Observatory and Planetarium is in there. Um, and then a Sloan Institute of Technology as well, all came together and decided to fundraise to build a, a radio telescope supported by Science Foundation Ireland and, and quite a number uh, of others. Um, and we collected about 2 million euros and began, uh, we went and ordered the telescope, but we needed to build it. So the first thing we did is I put out a job advert saying want to build a tel radio telescope this summer. And we had loads of applications from all around uh, Ireland, from, uh, from, from, from the continent, from as far away as America. And we, we interviewed lots of uh, enthusiastic young engineers and scientists and hired 25 of them. And they all came to Burr. They spent three months down in Burr and they built a radio telescope for the summer. So what a, an amazingly cool project to do that. Um, and many of these students have gone on to do master's degrees and, and um, uh, postgraduate degrees um, in engineering and this girl over here is uh, now working in space science in a space technology company um, others are this gentleman here it is now working um, uh, in, in data farms uh, this girl here uh, is actually now building Ireland's first nano satellite or, or, or CubeSat uh, this gentleman here is um, now doing a um, PhD with me on solar radio astronomy. So all kinds of uh, different people doing uh, lots of different things with their lives nowadays. But during the summer of 2017, this is what they did. They donned their hard hats, their high vis jackets, their wellies, or their, and uh, they built a radio telescope. They laid hundreds of kilometers of cables. So you can see the cables here. These are coax cable cables. This is Aoife, actually. So Aoife Ryan is uh, one of my PhD students now. She's very proud of, of, of doing this. And this is another uh, research scientist. Her name is Diana Morrison. Diana is now in Finland, um, having built this radio telescope and still working on radio, te thing, te radio telescopes. But you can see how proud they were of all of the work that they did. And Diana actually was responsible for wiring up 96 times two uh, of these, uh, uh, actually, excuse me, 96 times four of these coaxial cables, and she got them all right. Uh, tough job. But the other members of the team were putting, to, were, had responsibilities for building the high band antennas. Here they are putting them together and then deploying them onto the field. You can see them uh, gently carrying the antennas out onto the field. And then once the summer, end of the summer came, we had this beautiful radio telescope uh, in Burr Castle. So you can visit it. Um, uh, so later this summer, hopefully when restrictions are, 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 are lifted, uh, take a trip down there with your school or, or with your family and you can go, to, we have a visitor center there, you can go and learn all about the radio telescope and see it for yourself. And here are the, the low band antennas out here on the right hand side and here are the low band antennas here on the left hand um, side. Okay, so when we turned it on, we were nervous, okay? Um, we, I had spent nearly 10 years of my life fundraising for this, planning for it, um, and then the students had all built it. We had contractors there from, from, from Galway who were, who were building it, um, the first radio telescope that had been built in Ireland. So we weren't sure if it was gonna turn on. And this is what we saw in the field. So this is a laptop, you can see my reflection here, um, and one of the Dutch engineers and this is data coming in. So this is shortwave radio over here. This is noise actually from uh, effectively, but this is FM radio out here. And this bump in the center is the sky. So we're able to see radio waves coming from the night sky. And there was lots of hoots and cheers as soon as we heard this. Now, for most people, that's not that exciting. It was for us, but Within a couple of weeks, we learned how to use the telescope to make images of the night sky. And if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I showed a picture of the night sky with a band of 
the Milky Way. Well, the Milky Way also emits radio waves and X-rays as well, but we're able to see those radio waves during the day or during the night. And this is an image of, of, of the night sky above County Offaly with the LOFAR telescope. And there was these two big blobs in there, which we had hoped to see. And also, down here, there's a big blob that's right at the center of the galaxy, of our galaxy called Sagittarius A, excuse me. But we also weren't sure if we were pointing in the right direction, so loaded it up into Python um, and used a piece of software called Stellarium, and there it was. We had Cassiopeia A, which is a supernova. This is a star that blew up. Um, Cygnus A, which is a radio galaxy, very bright radio galaxy, just glowing at lots of radio waves, exactly where it should be. And then this is the Great Northern Spur, was, which was exactly where it was, should have been, and this um, uh, backbone of the Milky Way galaxy as well. So we were very relieved. Now, that gave us a telescope in Ireland. So our students, um, our undergraduates, our postgraduates, and our research scientists could now do uh, international grade radio astronomy from Ireland. And not only that, we could hook into this telescope. Now we have a telescope that goes from Burr right across to Eastern Poland, and that's 2000 kilometers. So now you have a telescope that's 2000 kilometers wide, and it, it, it now is the biggest radio telescope in the world, and Ireland is part of that network. And we now work with, 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 with scientists from across uh, Europe as well, um, and our data is pumped at three gigabits per second into that. Actually, our just to give you an idea, our fiber bill is about fifty thousand euros per year. So that's how much the internet costs for us, and we're very glad that uh, Open Air have sponsored much of that cost. So thank you very much to Open Air. But with the big telescope, you're then able to zoom in on some of these objects. And with the Iris Low Far Telescope, remember it's about a couple of hundred meters across. And uh, so uh, D in that case is a couple of hundred meters and delta theta is, is, is still degrees. So you can't really resolve things. But if you use the entire telescope where D is now 2000 kilometers, then delta theta becomes even smaller. And then you can see things like this. And this is Cygnus A and you're zooming right in on a galaxy. Actually, and I should say that on the Leaving Cert paper a couple of years ago, there was a question all about LOFAR and the Great Leviathan Telescope. Uh, so if you're looking at your past exam papers from a couple of years ago, um, uh, there's some some uh, a question in there all about the great telescopes of, of Burr. But what we're able to see now with LOFAR and the entire array are these jets of hot gas coming out from a radio galaxy. At the center, there's a black hole, and then this is hot gas that's emitting X-rays, and you put them all together, and you get a comprehensive view of what's going on. Now, I'm particularly interested in the sun, and these are a sequence of images taken in the extreme ultraviolet, so nearly X-rays, and it's taken by a, a satellite called uh, GOES SUVI. It's a it's a NOAA, it's a US uh, satellite. Um, but what happened here was back in September of what was it of 2017, um, there was an explosion here on the sun called a solar storm, and with the radio telescope we were able to work out when that explosion happened, and not only when it happened, but when it moved outwards, where the shock wave came from. Because as these explosions move out through the solar atmosphere called the corona, they can generate shock waves. And those shock waves can emit radio waves. So we can use the radio waves to study these shock waves. And here's some of our data. It isn't as pretty, um, but what it can do is it, can sh it shows us that there are these blobs of radio emission coming from around this explosion. And it tells you that there was a shock wave over here on the bottom of this image. And this, it, this, these data over here are, are particularly interesting for me, but what they do show you is that there's just lots of small stuff going on. And it just means that as the shock wave is expanding through the sun's atmosphere, it's constantly accelerating little jets, little pops of electrons moving out, forming currents effectively, out into this out into space or out into what we call the heliosphere the solar system so this was a result published in, in nature astronomy um, uh, actually our first paper was published in nature astronomy diana morrison was the the first author on that paper okay so 
we don't do all of our astronomy from the ground. We do almost all of our astronomy from the ground, but we also use spacecraft. And in February of last year, um, I was lucky enough to make it out to Florida um, to see the launch of a spacecraft called Solar Orbiter. And the reason I'm showing you that is because we use LOFAR working with a, a spacecraft or with other spacecraft. So you'll see this going off. Now beginning the pitch over maneuver, body rate response to look good. Seeing good engine operating parameters on the RD-180 engine. Now passing 15 seconds, Atlas propellant utilization system is going so to- So this is an Atlas, system. it's a very large rocket. And it is just quite incredible to witness one of these. And on the day, I'd been working on the spacecraft called Solar Orbiter for about 10 years. So here I am looking extremely stressed out. Uh, <laughs> beforehand, I don't look like a happy person at all, and I should have been happy. But the spacecraft launched and um, got it into position and then deployed its solar sails, so, not solar sails, solar panels. Here's its solar panels. This is the high gain antenna. And there's lots of equipment all over this. And the, one of the cameras on board is called Sticks. We work on that camera. Here are the cameras sticking out. And actually, I should say that I'll just pause that there for a second. That black stuff here is actually from an Irish company called Inbio. The sunblock that's protect, protecting that billion euro spacecraft was it came from an Irish company. And that spacecraft is going off. It took off from the Earth in February. Then it swung past or swung past um, uh, Venus, and it swings past Venus again in December, just gone past, um, and then it goes past and does another swing by uh, later this year, August. And as it's doing so, it's getting into the inner solar system, and it's ultimately going to get to about one third of an astronomical unit, one third of the distance from the sun to the Earth, and give us really close-up views of the sun. And what we're going to do is actually what we're already doing is using LOFAR and BRRRR to study solar radio bursts, but also using images from this spacecraft together to understand solar flares, where, where, where they happen, how much energy is involved in them, what speeds the gas is going at when it's ejected from the sun, and ultimately how it's going to affect us here on planet Earth. Now, with LOFAR, you can make lots of other kinds of, of interesting observations. I mentioned this uh, object here. So here's a pulsar. Um, this is a, a star about 10 kilometers across, but it's rotating uh, many, many times per second. So you can imagine something 10 kilometers across rotating many, many times per second. And it has this kind of lighthouse of radiation that as this swings around, it constantly gives you pings. And with the telescope, this is what we picked up from LOFAR. We picked up uh, lots of these pulses. And one of my students now, David McKenna, is working away on, on, on these. And he's seeing many, many more pulsars and testing Einstein's general theory of relativity. Of course, we couldn't but uh, have a big telescope and, and not look at the Whirlpool galaxy. So here is the Whirlpool itself, and here's the radio waves. And if you zoom in again on that, this is a picture make it, made by Sean Mooney from UCD. You can see that here's the LOFAR observations showing all the gas and dust, but you can also measure magnetic fields with radio waves. And here it is compared uh, to the third Earl of Ross's picture. So um, you can not only see um, these radio waves, you know, the radio waves give you an insight into the gas. They, give you they tell you about the temperature of the gas, the density of the gas. They tell you about the magnetic field. They tell you about the shape of the galaxy. But at the center of these galaxies as well, there's something really interested, interesting. And that those are one of the most exotic objects in the universe, and they are black holes. And um, here's a picture, and this is what I grew up with, and even at college thinking about a black hole and probably thinking that they didn't exist at all. But what we thought was there'd be a jet of hot material moving outwards from it. And then there'd be this thing called an event horizon. And if a photon or in fact anything went inside that event horizon, nothing would ever escape. In fact, no light or no information whatsoever would escape from within that black hole. And that's where we were. But that didn't, st and remember these objects are very, 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 uh, well, they're dark, but they're, they can be quite small as well. But, as I started at the beginning of this talk, in order to see smaller and fainter, you build bigger. And that's what astronomers then came to do with a great telescope called the Event Horizon Telescope, the EHT. And what they did is they took telescopes all around the world. So here's one in Europe, and 
two in, uh, in, in, in the, well, one in the United States, in Mexico, and then there's one over here in, uh, uh, in Hawaii, and then one in South America down here as well. But it gave you a telescope that wasn't just 100 meters across or 1,000 kilometers across, it was actually, what is that, 12,000 kilometers across the diameter of the Earth. And this allowed scientists to then peer right down to the smallest scales inside the core of a galaxy. And this is the M87 elliptical galaxy. And with a standard telescope, we could see that there was a jet. Now that jet implies that there must be something very energetic in there. And what we'd always thought was postulated was that there was a black hole inside it. Now, if you zoom, zoom in on that again, you see that, okay, there is a jet and it goes the whole way through. And yes, there is something bright in the center of that. And if you zoom in again, then you can see maybe there's something that's a bit dark in the center of this. And this is where we were getting over the past 10 years. Now with the LOFAR telescope, we were able to take an image of it and we got this. We could see that there's a huge blob of gas around it and there's these jets of material coming outwards. Then with another telescope called the Very Large Array in the United States, we zoomed in again, and then again with the Very Large Array again. And again, you're seeing that you're getting closer and closer. But with the Event Horizon Telescope, we were able to see at the very heart of this cloud, there's a black hole. And it looks almost exactly like, sci like you know, scientists had actually predicted using Einstein's general theory of relativity. And this made the front page of every newspaper across the planet last year when it was discovered. And, and in fact, when I saw it, I was just absolutely shocked by how close it was to theory. And what you see in here is you have the black hole at the center, or it's a shadow of a black hole. It's where no light can escape. Um, you have a boundary called the event horizon, where no light can escape. And then this is actually lensed material. It, the black hole is so massive that it bends space and time, and light moving through that space and time gets bent. Now, using my advanced skills in PowerPoint, <laughs> this is what it looks like. So just to give you an idea from any of those movies you've seen about black holes, this is what um, uh, you would expect to see. You can see a jet of material coming out of it. You can see the black hole in the center. And this actually is called an accretion disk. And it's actually material that's flattened down and is uh, being swallowed up by the black hole. And as it moves inwards towards the center of the, of the black hole, it gets hot and it emits X-rays. But with radio telescopes, you can see this light and you can see this light. So with these radio telescopes like LOFAR and like the Event Horizon Telescope and with satellites like Solar Orbiter, it's giving us new views. When I was your age, there was only nine planets. There's now 4,000 planets and we're going to find more. When I was your age, <clears throat> there was, and um, we didn't know of, it was only theory about black holes. We've now got pictures of them and we're going to get even more beautiful, more spectacular, more insightful pictures with bigger and more advanced telescopes um, and see the, the, the really more black holes. We've only seen one in the universe and there are many. We're also going to see things like gravitational waves. We, uh, again, when I was your age, we didn't have, we knew about them theoretically, but we've measured gravitational waves. So when two black holes or two nuclear neutron stars collapse and hit, bang into each other or collide with each other, they emit ripples in space-time and we can see them nowadays. So astronomy is going through a real revolution and telescopes like LOFAR and us luckily enough to have a telescope like this in Ireland allows us to take part in that and make discoveries and for us as scientists to make those profound discoveries is what it's all about but it also gives people like you young scientists with great ideas to get involved in these great projects. So I'd encourage you to think big and think great Think challenging ideas, think difficult ideas, and um, come and join us and, uh, and, and maybe win a Nobel Prize in the future. So thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take a few questions. And I'll finish on that slide there that uh, with myself and Commander Chris Hadfield, the astronaut, um, and, and a quote from uh, Richard Feynman, surely you're joking, Mr. Gallagher, and I can tell you this much, I am not. So thank you very much. So I am going to take some questions and I hope um, that Lucy is going to relay them to me.
Hi, Peter. We don't have any questions as of yet, but I would like okay. to encourage everyone to put them in the chat box and we'll share them. So I'll just give everyone a moment to get their thoughts together. Might be that a class might be deciding what question to go in. Very good. Okay, we have a question to say, what ha made you interested in astrophysics? Oh, um, you know, when I was a teenager, I was interested in the way things worked. That, that's what really got me going. Um, I was interested in how the TV worked. I really wanted to know how the radio worked. I wanted to know how the, uh, how the phone worked. Um, I wanted to see inside my dad's engine in his car. So it's just really interested in all of that. And, and um, then I, I actually, in school, I struggled with maths, I have to say. Um, I really, I had to work hard at maths. And it was only in sixth year that it clicked, um, that I got good at maths. And, uh, um, and, and then all of a sudden, I just became really good at maths. And I went on to college and uh, I got into UCD and I started studying chemistry and physics and maths. And I just really disliked chemistry. Um, I, I found it very uh, difficult, in fact. But I took up chemistry. I took up physics at university. Actually, I hadn't done it for my leaving cert, and I just found that uh, my maths helped me do my physics. And I did well in my exams. I got, I think, I got sixty-eight percent or something in my first physics exam uh, in the summer. And my parents bought me a *Brief History of Time* by Stephen Hawking. And I haven't looked back since. It was a Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking that just convinced me. I read the book and I said, this is amazing. I just, I, I just really want to study this subject. So that got me going. But I must say that um, at the end of college, I thought, how the hell can I get a job in astrophysics? Sure, there's no jobs in astrophysics. And my parents agreed. Uh, they thought I, would be, I was crazy. And um, I went off and I did a master's in optoelectronics uh, in Queen's University of Belfast because I thought I'd get a job in lasers and, and, and fiber and so on. And during that, um, I had, they actually sent me on a project uh, down to the Canary Islands to work on data from a telescope because I knew a little bit about optics. And uh, I was looking at galaxies and that was the end of that. I just gave, I couldn't take it anymore and I just became a, an astrophysicist. And I haven't looked back since. And I ended up working at NASA for three years, which was kind of a, a highlight. And now I'm back in Ireland building radio telescopes, so kind of dream come true. Great, now we're getting loads of questions, so I'll try and pick some for you. Okay. Could you explain how data represented on something like a graph goes all the way to becoming a photograph of a black hole? Yeah, isn't it? It really is um, almost magic um, because these telescopes, uh, the radio telescopes take in ones and zeros. Well, actually they don't, they take in analog signals. And uh, so you get an analog signal and then you convert it into a digital signal, which is then ones and zeros. And then it comes into your computer as ones and zeros. Um, and you get lots of ones and zeros and you put them together with an algorithm and uh, eventually get data. Now with a normal optical telescope, it's actually really well, it's easy enough. Actually, here's my mobile phone that has a, a camera in it and it has lots of little pixels in it and light goes into the pixels um, and those pixels get converted. And then you have an array, like a matrix. You probably do a matrix, I think, I'm not sure if it's still on the leaving cert, but a matrix is like a vector, but it has lots of, lots of elements in it and that turns into a picture. With a radio telescope, you take the data and you load it up into this matrix and then you can make pictures. And it can take, you know, a graduate student who has an undergraduate degree in physics nearly a year to make one of these images. So that Event Horizon Telescope took many scientists and many engineers to, to make that image. So it's, it, it is not trivial. Great, thank you. Um, a great question here. If Offaly becomes urbanised and there's a lot of light pollution, what effects would that have on LOFAR? Lots of ifs in there. Um, mm. uh, so lo optical light we don't care about. Um, so if it snows, if it rains, we don't care about that at all. Uh, you can turn on the lights, uh, it can be daytime and we don't care about that. The one, the one thing that really can be difficult for us are wind farms. So wind farms, the turbines on them um, can generate radio waves and they can cause a flicker 
in our signal. So they can be bad for us. Um, light emitting diodes, LED lights, can, can be bad for us. So street lighting, when they convert to LEDs, excuse me, they, they can emit radio waves, so they can be bad for us. Drones uh, aren't particularly good for us uh, either. Um, so it's important that uh, we have some kind of protection um, in, in that area. Um, for optical telescopes, of course, uh, it's a very different thing that uh, just standard light can be affected. But we can go blind from some of those other technological systems. So what we have asked for in the Offaly region is that we have five kilometer zone where there won't be wind farms uh, that, that could, could cause flicker in our data. Okay, and I guess one final question, because uh, we're running out of time. Have black holes had any influence on our planet? No, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> we, we haven't had any uh, effects of them. We, the, we feel gravity from our sun and that keeps us in, in our orbit. And the centre of our galaxy has a black hole, and we feel the effects of that gravity, which keeps the sun in an orbit about our galaxy. So yes, there is an effect of 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 a black hole, but we're not close enough for it to cause any dangerous <laughs> effects. And I see a question there from Paul Nugent actually there, mm -hmm. saying, "Would you recommend doing physics for the Leaving Cert?" Um, and, and I absolutely uh, would uh, recommend. Um, uh, trying to, or doing physics for the Leaving Cert. I think it's a kind of subject that uh, is, is very broad. Um, and, um, you know, it tells you about electricity, it tells you about, you know, climate change, it tells you about stars and astronomy. Um, if, you, if you want to understand uh, all of those kind of things, and if you like a little bit of maths, then uh, physics uh, may, might be the, the thing for you. And it can lead on to engineering and architecture and uh, uh, science as well. So it's a great foundation subject to have.